We'll be discussing in this particular lecture, which is which happens to be the fourth lecture for week two, uh, how the basic molecular biology techniques that we discussed in the previous lecture can be used for diagnosis. Say, suppose you have a family um, which is affected with a disorder, and you want to diagnose, do a DNA diagnosis to understand whether an individual is uh, having any mutation in the gene or not, and whether that information can be used to predict whether the few, you know, his brother or sister who is not shown any symptom as of net, as of now, will develop the disease later, right? So that's the uh, you know focus of uh, this particular uh, lecture. So what you can see in this particular you know pedigree in the screen is that it is a uh, typical autosomal recessive uh, disorder family, and you can see that affected parents are unaffected, and there is a consanguinity, and you have uh, you know done a DNA, DNA cloning for a gene and then you have done a sequencing and you identified a disease uh, mutation, something that we discussed in the previous uh, class. And uh, the mutation is that you have a point mutation resulting in the change in the codon. Uh, now, in the place of uh, tough an amino acid, you have a stop codon. So, this individual is obviously homozygous for this particular mutation. The question that you would like to ask is, if that is the case, what is the you know genotype of these two individuals? Assuming this uh, you know um, disorder in this little late onset, let's assume that it the, the symptom sets in around uh, when the individual is around 40 years or so. So these individuals may be still they are young; they are 12, 13, 50, 20 years or whatever. The, what is the um, genotype whether they will have the symptoms when they are reaching around 35, 40 years. So, you want to look at the gene sequence. Now, if whatever we have discussed in the previous class that is going for making a library and pulling out the clone, sequencing is a laborious task, it takes years to make this uh, advancement. So, what you are interested is to quickly understand within a day or two whether these two individuals have this particular variant or not, that is your task. So, how will you really go about doing it? Can you quickly genotype these asymptomatic individuals? The answer is yes. There is one powerful uh, technique that we have which is called as uh, PCR or polymerase chain reaction. Many of you would have um, heard about it and, uh, and, and, and would have read it about this particular uh, approach. So, what we are going to use is uh, you know, what you are going to discuss is how this technique uh, can be used to screen for mutations in individuals. So, this is a diagram which pretty much tells you the principle behind polymerase chain reaction. Again, it is a very, 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 you know, the concept is very simple, and uh, but it is so powerful technique that uh, the discoverer uh, received Nobel Prize for this discovery, right. So, it uses again. Um, the concept is from our DNA replication machinery. So, how our cells divide. So, in our cell whenever the cell divides the DNA gets copied and uh, you have a protein that you know mainly you know does the function of copying the DNA which you call as DNA polymerase. Likewise, you know you also in this reaction we add a DNA polymerase, but the difference is this particular polymerase can withstand temperature very high temperature because these uh, uh, proteins are isolated from um, microbes that were uh, living in hot springs. Uh, therefore, you know the, the ideal temperature for them to survive is around 60, 65 degrees. They are very happy in that temperature. Therefore, the protein also functions very efficiently at a very high temperature. And even if you boil the protein to 95 degrees or 100 degrees, the protein once it gets back to 60, 65 degrees, it is able to you know regain its function and, and, and do whatever job it is supposed to do. So, that is the advantage of such kind of proteins and people have used uh, that protein to do this reaction. So, what is this polymerase chain reaction? Polymerase meaning it is you know you are making a polymer simply copying the DNA, a new strand is being made, bases are added based on the sequence that is available in the template strand. 
why do you call a chain reaction? Because you know you are repeating this similar process again and again, right? How does it really help you? Something that you can see. So, what you need for a polymerase chain reaction? Of course, you need the template. So, if I want to see a given individual whether he or she carries a defective allele, what I need is the DNA from that individual. So, we extract the DNA, very little amount of DNA is good enough. And then I need what is called as primers, um, the one that are shown here, you know these are called as primers, what they are. Say suppose this is my DNA region that I want to be sequenced. So, my um, gene falls from here to here, somewhere there could be a mutation. So, what I need to do? I design a primer, for example, this is phi prime, this is phi prime. I design a primer that goes and binds to this sequence. Likewise, I design a primer that goes and binds here and then that is what is shown here, here and here. So, when this sequence, the primer sequence, these are nothing but you know short oligonucleot sequence that are synthetically made, they are DNA sequence, they go and bind because they have the complementarity. So, it will not go and bind anywhere else, uh, because the sequence are so unique, because they designed that way. Once they bind, your uh, DNA polymerase you know extend these you know region. So, that is what DNA polymerase does, it goes and sits and keeps on copying all the strands that are present next to it, right. So, it extends, you allow that to happen for some time and then what I do is, then again I you know denature the DNA. So, I heat the you know DNA uh, tube, uh, tube containing DNA. Therefore, you know these two strands separated and again I do the same reaction. So, what happens? So, I have completed for example, primers were added and then you know the synthesis took place as I discussed just a while ago. Then I increase the temperature that is what called as denaturation. You heat the reaction to say 95 degrees then all the hydrogen bonds are broken. So, again the DNA becomes single stranded, but you have excess amount of primers sitting in the tube. So, they are going to go and bind once again to the complementary sequence and the DNA polymerase is active again when you bring it back to a normal uh, temperature for the DNA polymerase that is around 65 or 72 degrees or so on and then it will extend again. So, it will copy. So, in when this process when again the primer gets extended, you know you have made new copies of DNA using the template that were already made. Now, what do you do? Again you go and melt it. So, all the DNA becomes single standard. Again the primers are available, they will go and bind to your newly synthesized DNA which has complementary sequence. Again the DNA synthesis happens. So, what do you do is? if you repeat this process for 30 or 35 times, you are going to make millions of copies of a small segment of the DNA, where the primary is able to bind and you know can make new sequences. In this process, you can make a small segment of your DNA, you know multiple copies, millions of copies can be made in a matter of 4 hours, 3 hours. So, at the end of that so called reaction, what you call PCR reaction, you can test and whether you have you are able to make millions of copies of a small segment of the DNA by running it in in a gel. So, this is one way you can check the amplification what you call as multiple copies of the DNA process. So, when you run it in a gel, so you can separate the DNA fragment according to the size and then you can add a dye and then you will be able to see them right that would tell you whether you are able to make these copies. So, that is one process with by which you are able to make you know millions of copies of small segments. So, depending on which gene you are looking at you can choose different primer sets and you can make mul you know copies of that. So, this is something picture that I am shown here to explain how the electrophoresis work rather you know uh, how you separate the DNA. So, what you have is here is the you have a matrix which is made up of a gel agar gel and this gel has got pores you know small pores through which the DNA can pass through if you apply force. Here for example, you have applied the DNA solution here and then what you did is that you have applied electric field here is negative here is positive. So, since the DNA is negatively charged and it has to migrate from this direction to this direction 
and when it does it has to go through the small pores that are present in the agar, agar gel. So, longer the DNA is going to take more time to pass through navigate the pore, shorter the DNA it will do you know relatively faster. So, as, as you can see here uh, this particular segment these are uh, called as size markers, these are DNA fragments of known size. You can see that this is a smaller fragment and this is a larger fragment, you are able to separate them. We know what is the size that helps us to you know identify the size of the other fragments. For example, um, these are the fragments uh, that are either extracted from a library or you have done a PCR to amplify and I can compare this band, this you know white band with this and I can say I know this is the size of this particular band therefore, this should be this size. So, this is the way I am able to one quantify the DNA for example, I have more DNA here, lesser DNA here or I am able to tell this is larger fragment as compared to this fragment and this particular sample has got two different fragments. So, I can interpret this in a various way depending on what is the condition I have used and what kind of information I am looking at it right. So, this is how you separate the DNA in agarose gel and then you are able to come up with certain conclusions. If you have done a PCR you will get a single band and single such you know kind of amplification which you can go for sequencing to identify what is the variation that is present. So, that is one, but there are other various uh, ways as well to detect whether you have a base change. So, what I am going to show here is a, a, a method that more commonly used in diagnosis and this is called as restriction fragment length polymorphism. What does it mean? So, we have uh, discussed about an enzyme called restriction enzyme these are in the previous uh, uh, you know class that refers to enzymes that identify a particular sequence and cut that right. And you call as restriction enzyme because they are unique to they are so specific to their sites right. They cut only when the site is present and uh, we can use this property to identify whether there is a change in the sequence. What is shown here is a schematic of um, some sequence. Uh, which can be digested or not digested by an enzyme. So, you can see here this is a allele representing wild type DNA and this is an allele representing a mutant version of DNA. You can see here it is coding and then 76 that is the base um, from the start code on ATG and this T is converted to A right whereas, the wild type will be T in this allele it is A. So, what it is shown? So, you have used a primer what are represented by arrow that are you know used for amplifying this segment of the DNA and then you know you are looking at this particular site this is T because the T is converted to A. So, what is uh, we are trying to show here is if the wild type has got T and the mutant has got A and you know because of the A coming in here the mutation changes the base uh, T to A. Now, this particular sequence gains a new site for an enzyme denoted as ALU1. In other words, this enzyme would cut this mutant allele, but not the wild type allele at that particular region. So, we can use this information to you know do a digestion, right? You do a PCR, amplify that segment, add this enzyme and then check whether it is able to cut there or will not be able to cut there. So, what is the sequence that you can see fragment size? So, if it is a wild type you will get from here to here which is 120 and there is a natural site present here both in wild type and the mutant allele, but this particular site is unique to this mutant allele. Therefore, this 58 base pair fragment will be made into 2 in case of mutants. In other words, if you have a mutant allele then the 58 base pair fragment will be missing. So, let us see this is in fact a family suffering from Laforage disease this work was done in our own lab. You can see this is a father mother and they have got 4 children of which 3 are affected and we have done this PCR to you know uh, detect and show the genotype. So, you can see here this 58 base pair fragment which is present in the wild type was seen father, mother unaffected and a control 
normal individual, but absent in the three affected. On the other hand, all the all the individuals of this family were having these two fragments that is 35 and 23 these two fragments they were present that that means every individual of this family carries the mutant allele. So, father and mother obviously are heterozygous even the affected unaffected brother who is not showing symptoms will not develop because he is having a wild type allele is heterozygous for the mutant allele as well. Whereas, you can see here this particular individual is a wild type not having the mutant allele at all do not show any such fragment. So, this is how really you can use the sequence information to come up with ways to you know quickly test whether a particular mutant allele is present in the other member of the family that we discussed right or not. So, you can either do a after a PCR you can go and do a sequencing or if you know such kind of allele is present in a in a given family you can simply do a restriction digestion and look at the banding pattern. So, you run the managel look at the different fragments that they make and you know put the pedigree and you will be able to clearly show the segregation and tell yes this individual will not develop Lafora disease because he is heterozygous for you know the mutant allele he has got a wild type allele therefore, he will not develop. So, this is some of the ways by which you will be able to tell that is about diagnosis. So, you know the gene you know that that is the gene when it is mutated results in the disease and you can sequence it you can look at the sequence variants there and then tell you know whether individual heterozygous homozygous whether you will develop disease and so on. Let us go beyond the diagnosis we look into some other aspects of you know uh, uh, DNA technologies or DNA molecular biology approach which help in human molecular genetics. One of the powerful techniques that people use for many um, um, issues is DNA fingerprinting or DNA profiling what they call. Um, we must have heard about it uh, in the newspaper or the news channels and so on. Uh, even uh, the, the, the suicide bomber of uh, former prime minister Rajiv Gandhi and she was you know identified or, or even our, her mutilated body was identified by DNA fingerprinting. Even the prime minister's body was uh, you know people are unable to recognize and they have done a DNA fingerprinting to identify the body or you know DNA fingerprinting is being used in many different cases. For example, somebody is murdered and the body is decomposed how will you know whose body it is right. So, can that be you know uh, confirmed whether this is the body of this particular person people use DNA fingerprinting or there are disputes for example, paternity dispute uh, two different uh, you know males claiming that uh, a particular child is their own he is the father. So, how will you prove that or it could be you know crime scene somebody is murdered and you do not know who is the culprit who did that and then you can look into the DNA you know the blood spots that are there and if this was a fight between two individuals at the end one was killed the other one would also have had some uh, uh, you know injury and so on his blood also would be there in the spot. So, can we identify that individual using this you know the DNA that is present in the blood and and many such uh, you know issues that one could really look at using DNA fingerprinting. Let us see what it is. What is shown here is a banding pattern of DNA it is shown is a schematic right of a paternity uh, dispute. So, you have mother and a daughter right what we do not know is who is the father for this particular child. There are two individuals who are claiming individual male 1 and male 2. So, so it went to the court and uh, you know the court ordered that let us do a DNA fingerprinting. So, they took the DNA from the mother the daughter the two um, suspect suspect meaning who are claiming that they are the father for this particular daughter right. So, this is the pattern that they got let us assume it is something like agarose gel and you have each band represent the DNA band. So, how would you use this information to tell who is father and mother. So, what you need to understand is that meiosis. So, something that we discussed in the in the previous week meiosis is that 
you know you all of us are uh, resulting from the DNA that we receive from father and mother and there is a recombination as well. So, what happens is that for every DNA segment that we have in our body we can match it either with your father or with mother. The same applies to anything that you part of it which you amplify using a PCR or you do a RFLP anything that you do all these changes that you see in your genome is derived from either your father or your mother. So, if you look into these variations you will be able to tell whether an individual could be a father or not. Certainly, you will be able to tell this person is not likely to be father right in this case. Let us look into that. So, this is what it is. So, we know who is mother. So, what we can do is we can compare the DNA profile of the daughter with the mother and as I told you 50 percent of the DNA comes from mother the other 50 comes from the father. So, at least let us match all those uh, <coughs> fragments that have come from mother. So, I have used a pink color here to identify the fragments that are likely to be derived from the mother right. So, there are unique fragments like what is shown here, 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 here these are not present in the mother. So, definitely that must have come from father. Now, what we need to look at whether each one of the fragments in the daughter that is not present in the mother therefore, likely to, to have come from father is present in which one of the two individual right. So, this is what it is. So, you can see here all the bands that were missing in the mother were present in one of the two males, male number 1. Some of them are absent for example, you know so if you if you look into there were some fragments which are altogether missing for example, this fragment this individual is not having. So, it could not have come from this individual right likewise this fragment missing in this individual too. So, could not have come from him with this approach we will be able to tell the biological father of this particular you know girl child could be male number 1 or at least we can say this individual is not likely to be his father therefore, number 1 the male number 1 is likely to be. So, this is one simple example to show the actual DNA fingerprinting will be more complex than this, but what we are going to see is how really you get this kind of pattern what is the genetic basis what happens at the DNA which help in you know seeing this kind of variations. So, it all happens because of certain unique sequences that you have in your genome which is called as variable number of tandem repeats what are that what do you mean by repeat for example, this is a repeat right this is a unit which can be you know repeated many a times at certain regions you could have 20 of them at certain regions you could have 25 of them and so on. So, what you see is that in a chromosome for example, if this is the chromosome in this particular segment of individual one you may have this is one repeating unit that is repeated for example, three times, but the same repeat in another chromosome it could be you know repeated may be uh, six times. So, likewise we are going to have different you know lengths of the repeating unit that is why it is called as tandem repeats one after the other head to tail you have them. So, in different individuals you are going to have different lengths of these repeats the same region for example, in individual 1 you have 4 repeats, but in individual 2 it could be for example, you know uh, it could be 5 repeats. So, how does it really uh, this kind of repeating pattern help? So, if you are looking at repeats for example, you know you have repeat 1, repeat 2, repeat 3, repeat 4 you have another allele which has got only for example, 3 repeats. So, the flanking regions that are seeing here the sequence that present on either side of the repeats are going to be common this is exactly the same like what you see because this is the same chromosomal region, but in different individual. Since the flanking regions are common you may have a restriction site here and here here also you are going to have the same restriction site, but if you digest with an enzyme which cuts here and here the resulting fragment that is generated between these two sites are going to be different depending on the number of repeats that you have more number of repeats here larger this fragment is going to be fewer number of repeats this fragment is going to be smaller you know. 
So, that is exactly what you know makes the difference. Perhaps this you know fragment that you are seeing here and the one above that represent the same region of the maternal and paternal chromosome. So, the for example, the maternal chromosome may have had you know fewer more repeats in that region therefore, it is little longer therefore, migrates slow whereas, this one migrates you know faster because the size is smaller. So, this is this this kind of variation that you see in the repeats really brings in the you know changes we are not just looking at one particular region of chromosome we are looking at you know hundreds of different sites in the chromosome. And when you do that such kind of calculations you know the probability that an individual will have identical combination of various alleles of various regions of the chromosomes is extremely low unless you are identical twin where the genetic makeup is identical. Otherwise, you are not going to match that is why it is called the fingerprinting because your fingerprints the thumb prints again are unique to individuals very rarely you will find the thumb prints patterns are you know identical in more than one individual. That is why it is called as DNA fingerprinting. So, it is the sequence variation that you have in your genome because of various alleles of the same region of the DNA that brings about difference in the migration patterns for the repeats. And if you use a repeat as the region to detect the fragments you are going to find bands like this and, and the bands are the pattern is unique to each individual by mapping it to either father or mother you will be able to identify which one had come from father which one had come from mother. But if you are unable to map it to one of the two parents that means that that individual may not be the biological you know parent. So, the same principle can be used for <coughs> forensic evidences for example, you have a crime scene where you have uh, spots and you have each spot you have collected blood spots you have collected separately extracted the DNA and you are doing the DNA typing for the person who, who, you know, who was killed in that encounter. And then you map whether every you know blood spot that is present in that crime scene matches with the DNA profiling. If it does not match that means that is the blood of another individual that is present. If you find more than one such pattern you probably will be able to predict how many individuals were there when this encounter took place right. And then you go with other you know uh, your investigations you find a suspect and then you will be able to match his DNA with the DNA pattern that you are able to get from the blood sample. So, that would pretty much nail that this person was present in that site when this death took place. So, this is how you are able to map it right. So, that is about you know the DNA fingerprinting right. Uh, how do you really do this? <coughs> we will go to little more details. So, basically you extract the DNA this is something that is shown here in this uh, schematic. You extract the DNA for that either you, you go for the blood samples or if the crime scene has got blood spots you can go with that and extract DNA because the blood has got white blood cells which are having the nucleus therefore, you can extract DNA and then you digest with the enzymes. So, it cuts on either side of for example, the repeat sequence as I said you have a repeat and you have a site on either side it is going to cut and, and then separate them you know you, you separate the DNA in a gel they are separated according to the molecular weight. This is a longer DNA it is a shorter DNA migrate faster and then what you do is from the gel the agar gel you pretty much what is called as a transfer the DNA to a membrane right. This membrane is a membrane that is a positively charged so the DNA goes and you know sort of irreversibly bound to the positively charged membrane because the DNA is negative. And therefore, the membrane would represent the agarose gel because it is the same position where the DNA was present in the agarose the same position will be transferred to the membrane. And we use the membrane to what you do as what you call as hybridization meaning you have the DNA strands separated and then transferred to the membrane in a single stranded form. So, once you are separated in agarose you, you treat with certain chemical for example, sodium hydroxide which breaks all the hydrogen bonds between the two frag you know strands of the DNA. And now you transfer the DNA uh, to the membrane that are that is present uh, that is kept over the gel. And what you do in this case is that you know you have a support wherein 
uh, uh, you have the gel and then on the top of that you put a membrane and you allow the salt solution to pass through the agar to over the membrane and to the paper towel that are kept on the top. So, in this process the salt solution would also carry the, the DNA and but the DNA cannot pass through the membrane therefore, they are stuck there and, and they are single stranded they are cross linked meaning they are irreversibly bound to the membrane. So, once you have it on the membrane, so now what we are, what I said was that the in DNA fingerprinting basically you look at the repeat sequence, because the repeats are tandemly repeated you know the, the units number of times they are repeated in a given region varies from individual to individuals. As a result you know the if you digest that DNA with an enzyme the fragments that would be produced because of you know detecting the repeat would vary because you know more number of repeats you are going to have larger the DNA. Now, you use the repeat as a you know probe what is the probe it is you take the complementary sequence of the repeat and then you label it with you know yeah, isotope radioactive isotopes you label and then you allow the labeled nucleotide to go and bind to the target. So, where are the targets these are already size separated. So, it will go and bind because these are single standard it will go and bind to the complementary sequence and then since they are radioactively labeled. So, you can put a film like what is shown here extra film and then wherever the probe is bound it would give you this kind of you know bands something like you know what is shown here. So, you can see so you in this lane you only found two bands here it is two here is one it is two and so on. So, it is a simplistic so you would basically get something like this. So, you will find multiple bands and then you will be able to match the banding pattern of every individual with the other and infer whatever you would like to infer right. So, this approach is called as southern hybridization because this was something an approach was developed by a person named southern therefore, it is called a southern hybridization where basically you hybridize a DNA with a DNA the difference is the one of the DNA the target is separated size separated in agarose gel transferred to a membrane and they are immobilized on a membrane. The probe is exact sequence that you are looking at right where are such for example, G A T T C where are such sequence present in your genome. So, use that sequence as a probe. So, wherever that homologous the corresponding complementary sequence is present it will go and bind to right. So, you can use various different types of sequences to profile right. So, that is is one such example of you know DNA profiling, but southern blot is not the only way by which you will be able to get uh, individual specific you know profiling DNA pattern. People also use the robust you know quicker PCR approach. So, what is shown here is, so you have exactly the same thing you have you know sequences which are repeats you could for example, the maternal uh, chromosome the, the chromosome that you derived from mother would have a shorter repeat the paternal one would have a longer repeat. So, if you amplify using a pair of primers that are that are binding to the regions that are present on either side of the repeat it would amplify from both, but the resulting PCR product would be different. If it is longer for example, it will migrate slow if it is shorter it will migrate faster, but if you do the similar kind of amplification from 40 different such you know regions of the chromosome or 40 uh, or you know all the each one of the chromosomes 22 pairs, then you are going to get a pattern which is you know uh, unique to a given individual for like something like shown here. So, you are going to you know for example, here you are looking at three different such repeat locus or repeat lo loci rather and then you are looking at individual 1, 2 and 3 and depending on what is the repeat size the alleles that are each one individual is having and the combinations you will be getting a pattern which is unique to each individual. For example, A individual has got a part pattern which is very very different from the other two individual. So, this you can do it in you know in about you know 4 hours 5 hours you will be able to type and tell whether these two individuals or the blood spots that you found in a crime is seen whether they all come from one individual or different individual if it is different how many 
you know individuals were likely to be there who, who had some injury and the blood spots are there or you can go and you know uh, solve a paternity dispute and so on. So, this is such a powerful technique which, which uh, people use to you know identify the match the DNA profile of different individuals or samples and give information whether it represent the same person, different person, whether it is a biological father or related you know even you can look at relatives for example the similarity is going to decrease with the uh, you know genetic distance decreasing right my i would be sharing more uh, my pattern of dna profiling will be more similar to my father as compared to for example an unknown individual and so on so we can really use this to uh, you know solve many questions so that's that powerful and with that uh, we'll be ending our uh, uh, the last lecture of this particular section um, week 2 and uh, we will be meeting again in the third week lectures where we will be looking into various different types of mutations and how they may contribute to the disease pathology right. See you again.